This is the Amazing Teacher Podcast with Sam Rangel, episode number 20. Welcome to the Amazing Teacher Podcast, where we sit down with amazing educators and pick their brains for tips, strategies, and ideas that you can take into your classrooms and be amazing. Now, here's your host, Sam Rangel. Welcome, amazing teachers, to the 20th episode of the Amazing Teacher Podcast. This is Sam from successintheclassroom.com, and I want to thank you once again for stopping by and, and listening to my conversations with uh, these amazing educators. It's really a, uh, means a lot to me that you're taking the time out of your busy schedule to, to listen and to uh, learn from, from these uh, guests that I have on the show. Uh, again, like I, like I always say, it's an inspiring uh, time that I have sitting down with these amazing educators. Today, I'm really excited about the podcast. Back about 25 years ago, I was a student at a, a college called Claremont Graduate School. Now it's called Claremont Graduate University. Uh, but that was where my teaching career began. And I was thinking, wouldn't it be nice to go back to where, where my career started and see what's happening in education today? So I contacted Dr. DeLacy Ganley. She is the director of the teacher education program over there at CGU. And I asked her if she would be willing to be on the podcast just to uh, let me pick her brain and find out what's happening in teacher education today. And she was so willing and so gracious to, uh, to help me out on the show and, and let me pick her brain. And so I took a trip back to my old school and, and it was really really cool just being there. I brought back a lot of great memories, a lot of great memories. And I, w I sat down with Dr. Ganley and we just had this great conversation about teaching and, and uh, what, what's going on in teacher ed today. And she offers some great tips uh, for teachers, new teachers and uh, soon to be teachers. And I'm so glad that uh, I had this opportunity to share her wisdom on the show. Uh, Dr. Ganley offers some great advice, especially when, um, when she asked me a question. She asked me a question about uh, why are new teachers always being asked to you know, lead a club or, or be in charge of some department their first year. And uh, I really didn't have an answer for her, but she uh, offers some great, great uh, advice for those teachers. How do you respond to your principal? How do you respond to your administrator when when they ask you to take on this responsibility your first year. She has a great response for, for those teachers in those situations, so listen for that. Uh, like I said, I had a great time talking to Dr. Ganley, and I know you are going to find a lot of value in what she shares on the show. So uh, before we begin, I just wanted to remind you, if you haven't already done so, take the Amazing Teacher Pledge. Again, it's a set of 10 promises that I believe if you can make and keep these promises, you will be that amazing teacher that our kids need and deserve. So head on over to theamazingteacherpledge.com and uh, take the pledge. Let's make a, a commitment to be that amazing teacher that our kids need today. All right, so without further ado, let's get right into the interview with the director of the teacher education program over at Claremont Graduate University, my alma mater, Dr. DeLacy Ganley. Ready? Here we go. Today, I'm so happy to have Dr. DeLacy Ganley, who is the director of the teacher education program at Claremont Graduate University. Welcome to the show, Dr. Ganley. Thank you, Sam. It's great to be here. Awesome. Well, um, like I mentioned earlier, this was uh, the school that I graduated from uh, over 25 years ago. And so I thought it was a good idea to come back and maybe um, talk, to, talk to you about what's new in teacher ed and uh, what, uh, what advice you might want to share with uh, the audience of soon-to-be teachers, new teachers. Great. So, so uh, thank you again for, um, for participating in this, in this podcast. It means a lot to me. Before we begin, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, um, your role here uh, as a director, maybe uh, your teaching career, and uh, maybe why you got into teaching? Okay, great. I'll start with the question of why I got into teaching. Um, but before I go there, I, I need to say that I think teaching is an amazing profession. I really feel glad um, that this is the professional choice that I made early on. 
um, I knew about myself as an individual that that I wanted something that would have um, be dynamic and have changes to it. And for me, that's what teaching is because when I was a teacher, even though the content or the overarching ideas of the discipline um, were sort of classic and in, in place, there was always new ways to relate that to what was happening in current events in the world. And every semester I had a whole group of new students to work with and meet. And so there was a sense of uh, renewal and change always happening in the profession that attracted me. Um, but why did I get into teaching? Well, when I first started off, um, I wasn't a K-12 teacher. Uh, I started off as teaching at the community college. And my first position uh, after earning my master's was um, to be a writing teacher. And so I was teaching freshman 101 at a community college back in my home state of Hawaii. And I had four sections um, on my first semester where the students had tested at a below a fourth grade reading level. And I was pretty naive, you know, and so my first reaction was, I don't understand this. How does this happen? I mean, these students graduated from high school. How could they be reading at a below a fourth grade level? Um, and the more that I got to know my students, I realized that they were able-minded and they were creative. And, um, and so it was this perplexing question of, what happened to their, their reading ability? And why was there this hole in their education? Um, and so I started asking questions. And so I started to talk to high school teachers and I said, how do you think this happened? You know, uh, and the high school teachers all said, oh, don't talk to us. Talk to those middle school teachers. If they prepared their students better, we would be able to do our job and you would be able to have students who could read. So then I went and talked to middle school teachers and I said, well, okay, here's the situation. What do you think happened? And they pointed that finger and they said, it's, it's not me. Don't talk to us. Go talk to the elementary school teachers. It's their job to teach reading. And so I talked to elementary school teachers and those teachers pointed a finger as well, but they pointed their blaming f fingers uh, at families. Well, it's not our fault. It's the family that's the problem. It's the, the family structure is breaking down or ah, we work with poor families. You can't expect much from them. And there was this myriad of sort of um, excuses that justified low expectations. Um, and so that was my first sort of interest and entree point into sort of school reform issues. Um, and so I continued to be a teacher. I actually left the community college and taught high school English and was always kind of had my eye on school reform. And at some point I decided I wanted to, to learn more about school reform from an academic point of view. And I decided to get my doctorate. And when I first went in, again, I was pretty naive and I thought it was about policy that if we could just identify the correct policies, mm -hmm. everybody would get in line and we wouldn't have the kinds of problems that I experienced with, you know, people being in college with a fourth grade reading level. But that was naive, as, as you know, Sam, because you can create a policy and that doesn't mean that there's buy-in to that policy or right. anything's actually gonna change. Right. So my research soon led me to determine that, that policy wasn't where it's at. So then I thought, well, it's about finance. If we finance our schools better, we will have the educational system that we need. Um, and finance does play a role, but it wasn't the be all end all because I could show you examples of schools where millions of dollars had been pumped into them and the instruction wasn't any better, that the student learning wasn't any better. So I realized, okay, it's, it's not finance either. And the more that I started researching, um, I realized 
from research, and it echoed my own personal experience, that the val variable that really matters in student achievement is the teacher. That uh, if you can have a high-performing, highly committed teacher, that teacher can bring about academic success in any population, even the populations that have been historically underserved by um, public schools. Mm -hmm. Um, and indeed, you can go to a school that serves a population where, by all these measures, the kids are at risk, right? You know, there's poverty and there's violence or drug use. And, mm -hmm. and, and, it, and in most of the classrooms, you will see a lot of absenteeism, poor scores. But then there will be some star teacher, you know, whether it's Mrs. Johnson or Mr. Martinez. And, and kids will cut school, but they'll come back. Mm -hmm for that one class. And you gotta think, well, how is uh, Mr. Martinez breeding success? And why aren't we looking at what, what he's doing? And so really that's what brought me to, to teacher education and really realizing the power of the individual teacher. Um, and if we could have a critical mass of such teachers, I think that that would be the variable. So with that, I started getting interested in teacher education and how do we help prepare highly effective teachers. I think what, what you mentioned, uh, the teacher being the variable, I think that is, that is so key. And I think that's what, um, what we're trying to do with, with, the, with the podcast. We're trying to identify these amazing teachers and, and share what they do. When I was in the classroom, I remember walking out of uh, the, my class and into the hallway and there was my math teacher. She was teaching algebra, and she had just had one of those days, one of those classes. And I walked over to her, and she looked at me and said, i got to remember, I'm the variable. I'm the variable. Yeah. And, you know, it, it connects to, to math because in algebra, that one variable will determine the outcome of, of, the, of the, uh, the problem. And so I think what you, what you say is key, um, that teachers make the difference, not necessarily policy or, or financing. So I think that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. What is, what is your role here, uh, Dr. Ganley, uh, as a director uh, in regards to finding these teachers and promoting this kind of uh, uh, amazing variable that, that we're looking for? Let's start by first maybe talking about what is it that an amazing teacher has? Like what, what are the legs that they stand on? And if I was to think about it in its simplest formula, I would say highly effective teacher knows their content is the first. They know how to teach their content. They have the pedagogical skills to teach that content. And then they have certain attitudes and attributes and outlooks on life and, and a disposition. Um, so there's, that's sort of the, the three legs of an effective teacher. And if any of those legs are weak or non-existent, the teaching isn't effective. Mm -hmm. So here in the state of California, it's assumed that people learn their content in their undergraduate college. And they come to a teacher preparation program with that piece in place. Mm -hmm. um, and for the most part, that's, that's true. Um, there'll be instances where people maybe need uh, a little bit of enrichment or enhancement on their discipline, but for the most part, teachers come, come to CGU uh, with their content in place. Um, so then I have to really focus on those two other legs. So I really want to recruit to CGU people who know their content, but who have particular attitudes in place that, that I know is going to set them up for success in um, the profession. Um, I'm going to want to see that they hold themselves accountable. I'm going to look for people who aren't afraid of hard work. Um, there's a lot of heavy lifting mm -hmm. to do in teaching. Um, Anybody who thinks that, that teaching is an easy job and I'll be done by three and I get my summers off um, really hasn't engaged teaching to the way that it needs to be taught. Um, I'm going to want to see that somebody has an eye for social justice, that they look at, at education as a civil liberties issue. 
um, that they're going to want to recognize social injustices and push against them, um, that they value um, all types of people, that they're looking forward to working with the, the families of students. Um, and really, you know, those are things that that's who you are as a person, right? I mean, I can, I can talk to you about the importance of looking at a child's family as, as your, an asset, as a partner to help you support the child. But if fundamentally somebody doesn't look, that, look at life that way, I'm not really going to be able to do much to change that mental mindset. Mm-hmm. Um, perhaps what I can, can do is I will also look for somebody that's willing, though, to change their mindsets. Because not everybody comes with all their mindsets in order, and we all have biases that, that aren't totally apparent. So I think the other variable that I look for is somebody that is going to be open-minded enough to say that, yeah, if I'm presented with data that runs contrary to my thinking, I better start updating my thinking. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think those are the types of attitudes that I look for in new candidates. So if they come to me with those sort of basket full of of attitudes and outlooks, Mm -hmm. Um, and they come to me with their content solidly in place, then I can worry about the third leg of how do you teach that? And that's what I can really work with them on. I think what you said was was, uh, so awesome when when you mentioned about uh, that teacher who is uh, looking at at their old selves as the the one to uh, maybe um, to blame for the kid's failure or or not not, uh, succeeding. There's so many teachers who are quick to label the kid as the bad kid, the bad kid. Um, have you seen that? I have seen that. Um, and I've even seen it in my own students. Uh, and these are students who, remember, have been recruited mm-hmm. because of these wonderful attitudes that they have and their commitment to social justice. The fact of the matter is that being a new teacher is very, very hard. And... As a new teacher struggles, and everybody does struggle in the beginning, it really takes a lot of maturity to sort of say at that point, you know what, I'm struggling because my game's not on yet. You know, I don't have all the skills I need. Um, That takes a lot of maturity. It's so much easier to say, well, I'm struggling because I have the bad kids. I got the class nobody else wants to teach because I'm the new teacher. Mm -hmm. You hear this all the mm-hmm. time. Or, you know, I'm teaching the Casey kids, you know, who haven't even been able to pass their exit exam. Um, and I think that's where fellowship comes in. Um, that's when you need a kindred spirit to sort of say, hey, Sam, what are you talking about, bad kids? Mm-hmm. You know? Let's go. And let's look at your lesson plan together. Let's work on it. Let's see how to, and and that's where that fellowship comes in. And and at CGU we usher people into the profession in a cohort model. So a new group of teacher candidates start at the same time and they finish at the same time. And that's by design because we want um, a new teacher to be surrounded by people who have those like ideals. So that they can bounce off each other, their struggles and their successes, but always with the fundamental belief that they are the variable. Um, Because I think it's so easy to kind of go to the dark side, (laughs) start blaming others. Very true. Um, And it's it's something that pretty uh, consistent uh, on the podcast is uh, for new teachers to to be careful hanging around those teachers who have already maybe have gone to the dark side. Yeah. Um, we, want, we want teachers to be influenced by you know, the, the positive ones, positive teachers, the teachers that are, right. are looking for uh, the good in a kid instead of, you know, complaining about the bad. So I think that that is awesome. That's great. Sam, can I talk a little bit about that? Sure. Because I think maybe earlier in my career, my advice to new teachers would have been, 
Yeah, stay out of the teacher's lounge. Mm -hmm. You know, the teacher's lounge can be highly toxic. Stay out of it, you know, so that you're not um, inclined to sort of go down that road and get caught up in, in, in that attitude. Just stay away. And I think as I've stayed in this position, um, as long as I have, I've shifted a little bit from that position and trying to recognize or trying to help my new teachers recognize that even the most jaded and curmudgeonly teacher has something that they can learn from, Mm. you know, and to try and maybe that's not the person that they're going to go to for inspiration, but boy, maybe they really have an understanding of how to teach that concept Mm -hmm. or how to teach this, or maybe they're really good at something. And um, I think perhaps because it's come back and bite me, I've I've become cognizant um, that it doesn't serve a new teacher well to sort of be the new hotshot and to be real critical Mm -hmm. of sort of the veteran teachers that have been in the trenches for so many years that um, that I try now to sort of say, you're right, you know, that there are going to be people that are really toxic, mm-hmm. but they've, they've been in there and they have years of experience. Try to find something, you know, try to, try to dig down and, mm-hmm. and see what is it that they really do well. Um, but with that said, I really try to tell my new teachers um, to find somebody on campus that they can get mentored by, you know, a buddy teacher, somebody that can kind of help pave the way. And I think that special person that you choose to be your buddy teacher or your mentor, I'm talking unofficially. I mean, Mm -hmm. it may be the person that you're assigned, Mm -hmm. that's assigned to help you, but often it's not, you know, it's somebody else. Um, Then that person really should have the same sort of belief systems um, and not be sort of the the curmudgeon that that needs to help inspire you for, to, to, to hold yourself accountable. Right, right. So good. You know, I, I advise the, the teachers you know, on, on my blog and on on, um, on the podcast to you know stay away, stay completely away from from those teachers. But you made a good point. There's there's a there's a reason why they're there. You know, and they have they have great uh, experience that we can draw from. Uh, the the concern is these new teachers are so willing to please sometimes. Oh yeah. They're so willing to um, you know make everybody happy that that you know I've unfortunately I've I've seen I can. Think of a couple examples where that teacher has has fallen into bad um, the bad light with administration because of their connection with with a negative teacher. But um, if if we can if we can find uh, the good in in and we we find good in, in kids, absolutely, we can find good in teachers as well. Right, exactly. <laughs> uh, I, I think that there's a lot of truth to 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 that parallel idea. The, the parallel idea that I play around with a lot, Sam, is, is this belief that if I believe all kids can learn, mm-hmm. then shouldn't I also believe that all people can learn to be good teachers? Mm-hmm. And that's something that, that I challenge myself to, to think about. I'm not sure I've totally arrived at an answer yet because I do believe that all kids can learn. I do believe that. And I do believe that certain people are much have a great a greater propensity to succeed in the profession than others. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's where I've landed. Instead of saying, you know, somebody can't be a good teacher, well, you could be. It might take you thirty years you know, <laughs> to get there. Is that really where you want to put your efforts? But but I, I challenge myself to think about if I if I really believe that there aren't bad kids, then you know. Uh, the like should be true. But, you know, the data shows that there are teachers that are not effective Mm -hmm. as well. And I really wish that there was a system that could help provide them additional support. Right, right. Well, Sam, let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. Um, As an administrator, um, sometimes it seems to me that new teachers um, are asked to do 
things on campus um, that are very time consuming. And so uh, I always think a new teacher's job, their main job, uh, is to get their chops down as a teacher. And so I always tell my new teachers when they get approached to run the yearbook or coach soccer or can you coach the football team or the debate team or take on the school play or whatever myriad of different activities they may be asked to do, um, to have a response in their back pocket. And the response I tell them to, to give is, oh, Principal Jones, I would love to do that, but I need to do that, in, uh, you know, maybe next year or down the line. I, I really am focusing on my classroom this year and, and have to spend the, my, my time and my energies there. But please ask me again next year. How does that hit your ears as an administrator? Son? You know, um, I, think that's, I think that's awesome. I think that's a great way to, to, rep to respond. Uh, but you're right. You're right. New teachers seem to be given the, um, the job nobody wants. Because, again, they're, they're, they're trying to earn their, their, their hire. You know? right. And uh, is it fair? No. And um, I, I don't think we've done it at, at our school, but when I, when I first started teaching, I was right away put in charge of a club. Yeah. And I wasn't ready for it. So you have a great point, and, and I, I think new teachers, that is um, a great, great response, uh, and it's especially if you're still trying to figure out what's going on uh, as far as uh, content and, and teaching. Well, they say teachers don't really come into their own until their third or fourth year, mm -hmm. you know. So. Well, I'm, this is my third year in my position, and I can look back now and I'm realizing, yeah, the first two years I was totally on my learning curve, learning yeah. what to do. So, um, very good, very good point, very good point. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, classroom management. Sure. One, one, of the, one of those issues that seems that is um, high on, on, the, on the list of issues that new teachers have. Oh, now, even, yeah. Even veteran teachers, but I think new teachers are when they get into their actual class with actual kids, um, it's, it's, it's tough. Very what tough. what advice would you give to a, a new teacher who may be struggling with classroom management? Well, it's going to sound like a cliche, but I would say, you're right. No instruction is going to go on until you have classroom management mm -hmm. down. I mean, you have to have routines and procedures in your classroom that allow the class to run smoothly, allow people to be heard, allow directions to be given, um, the, the, the paperwork of the class to be handled effectively. You need to have those in place in order to be able to utilize um, time effectively. Mm -hmm. I tell teachers that their most effective, their most precious resource is time. Mm -hmm. And if they don't have effective classroom management, they're, they're using a lot of that precious time mm -hmm on things other than instruction. Right. So, okay, that stresses the urgency of classroom management, but that doesn't help somebody get good at classroom management. Um, so I would tell people, um, sort of what I've said before, find somebody who's really good at it and watch them. Watch what they do. Right. Um, see classroom, effective classroom management in action. Um, my son's second grade teacher is amazing with classroom routines and procedures. Those kids come in and they know what to do and they take ownership of that classroom and boy, it's handled um, what other teachers may take an hour and a half to do. She has done in a matter of, of, of nine minutes. Right. Observe a teacher like that. Um, the other is, is, you know, to read. Um, classroom management. Um, one of our instructors here always tells his candidates, you should have um, three things at your bedside table. He tells new teachers this. You should have um, a book that deals with your content. You should always be pushing your content. Mm -hmm. You should have a book that deals with pedagogy or how to teach. And you should have a journal. Those are his three. But Lately, I've been looking at um, some classroom management books because so many of our candidates struggle with it in the beginning. Um, I've been reading some Marvin Marshall, 
and he he has a book um i think it's called effective teaching without stress and uh, i i can't remember the name of it but it's marvin marshall and he has uh, a blog as well and sends out notes um the ideas that i like in and he has some very specific procedures but one of the things that he says in his book is that he tries to think about discipline as not the verb but the noun instead of um is that correct instead of saying like i am going to discipline you i'm going to help you learn Mm self-discipline and how do you have the onus be sort of an internal motivation and he has a system Um, that I think probably works better with younger kids and probably better when the whole school commits to the system that really is rooted in helping the, the, the student recognize where their behavior falls in terms of are they doing what they should be doing or are they being unruly or are they being uncooperative and so forth. The other person that I've been reading a lot of, um, is Janice Noel... Janice Noel, I think her name is, and she's a behavior um, specialist that works a lot with parents, Um, and I think her title of her series is something, Calmer, Happier Parenting, but the principles, she really started working off first with teachers, Mm. and I think her principles uh, really are insightful. Um, She has a CD series, and... I recognize the wisdom of what she says, even though I recognize how difficult it sometimes is to implement Mm -hmm. uh, some of her strategies. But um, time and time again, I see how they work. Like um, she has something that she says, she calls descriptive praise. And she says, um, you gotta engage in descriptive praise. And it's kind of that idea that you have to, be telling them when they're doing something good and and you're acknowledging the good. Um, But she says that your descriptive praise needs to be specific. So she gives an example, again, out of the parenting realm, that is instead of the parent saying, son, you're using really good manners. Instead of saying that, you say, son, you have your napkin on your lap and you're wiping your mouth with it instead Mm -hmm. of your sleeve. So specific. specific. Very specific. Um, so in the classroom, what are the, the specific behaviors that you're going to um, be promoting? You know, it's not just like you're quiet. Wow, you're engaged. Right. You know, you I see you sitting and your eyes are tracking me. You know, very yeah. specific praise is one thing. Um she talks about, um, she has techniques on kind of how to change the mood, particularly for elementary kids when, when and, I, and I'll see this with my kids and their fra- friends, I don't want to, whatever it is, right? Uh, I don't want to do that. And instead of dismissing it, like, sure you do. Yes, you want to do that. This is good for you, mm-hmm. right? Like you tap into fantasy, Yeah, wouldn't it be fun if we never had to get out of bed and we could stay here all day? And and they'll kind of one-up you. Yeah, and just eat jelly beans? Yeah, (laughs) and if we could have jelly beans and french fries all day and all of a sudden it's no longer this, I don't want to do this, but the mood has switched too and they don't see you as discounting what their want is. You know, but you kind of just, like, oh, yeah, wouldn't that be fantastic? And time and time again, it it helps. So Marvin Marshall and Janice Noel um, are two people that I think have some interesting ideas. Um, If there's time to sort of share one other idea on classroom management. Sure. Um, When I was a teacher, a new teacher, I I had a challenging first, first run. And so my response to that was, well, I'm going to make a syllabus that's really clear about all of my expectations. 
And that backfired because what I did was I privileged the syllabus, Hmm. you know, if it wasn't in the syllabus, it wasn't a rule. And so I found myself that next semester continually revising my syllabus until it was 72 pages long Mm -hmm. and accounted for every single instance and infraction that could occur because um, I had put, I had empowered this document. And reflecting upon that, I realized I had made some some mistakes. So I had empowered the syllabus and sort of in the process um, disempowered myself and my students and found that that wasn't the, the, the tact I wanted to take. So the next semester, I tried something different. And I mentioned this before, I'm from the state of Hawaii and I was teaching in Hawaii. And I really realized Now, it may sound hokey from a mainland perspective, but it was this idea of aloha that really is strong in Hawaii. And and everybody knows what it means. And it was kind of like, if you're not living aloha, don't do it. That's what this, you know. Mm -hmm. And that simple concept covered everything. You know, so uh, if somebody was distracting to their neighbor, it was like, come on, man. That's not aloha. If somebody wasn't trying hard, that wasn't a law. You know, I mean, it was just, it was such an easy, because everybody culturally had such a connection to this and understood what it meant. Um, that it And it covered so many areas, how you talk to people, how you listened, your effort, how you treated classroom materials. And that was all I ever needed after that. Wow. that that's so cool. That's not aloha. What a, what a great uh, response yeah. to, a, to a kid who's uh, not, respect, basically respect. Yeah. And uh, Not respecting themselves. Right. And, uh, you know, and for, in Hawaii, it has such a connection to the land, to, mm-hmm. to the environment, to, the you know. The family. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, one of my most popular posts has to do with uh, you only need two rules in the class, respect yourself and respect um, each other. Yeah. And... Uh, and uh, that that that's so so true. And I think a lot of I know when I first started, I had a myriad of, of rules. You know, yeah. they even give you a poster that has you know pre-made rules, right? And rules. consequences. Yeah. You do this <laughs> yeah. offense, and this is the consequence. Yeah. So uh, no, I I think that uh, that is so so good as far as uh, classroom management. What if you could sit down with a new teacher, mm-hmm. just starting out in their career? What and you only had time for one piece of advice. What advice would you offer that new teacher? I tell them to commit to developing their craft. Um, and embedded in that is the notion that they got to hang in there. Mm-hmm. Too many people um, leave our profession. Mm-hmm. Um, there's statistics that over 50% quit within three years of, of teaching. Um I'd want them to know that if they commit to working on their craft, every year gets easier and they're better and more effective. Um, So they gotta ride through that initial part where everybody struggles and it doesn't always seem very fun. Um, That they just gotta put their head down and do the heavy lifting to be a good teacher, master those skills, find a good mentor, but hang in there. Right, hang in there. And, and I think um, when I first started teaching, we didn't have resources like uh, Twitter right. or, or the podcast or anything like that. So it, it was tougher. I think now there's so much support out there uh, online um, with your colleagues. So uh, great, great advice, great advice. Hang in there. It gets better, teachers. It gets better. <laughs> it does. And, and none of my teacher candidates believe it mm-hmm. when I tell them. But then I see them the next year, and they're like, oh, you're right. And then I see them two years down the line, oh, you're really right. But it's a hard thing because I don't think new teachers are really in a space to hear that message. True, true, true. Well, what is happening now in maybe in your life or in, at CGU that you're excited about? Um, well, you know, it's uh, always going to... I think there's two things. Um, one is is an artifact of the fact that you've come today. And I have just submitted um, an NSF grant that I'm hoping that we will get. Uh, and I'm excited about that. Uh, the NSF grant would allow us to provide um, tuition support 
and five years of professional development for math and science teachers mm -hmm. to help them um, become STEM educators. And it's sort of this idea that just because you teach math or science, that doesn't mean you teach STEM, mm -hmm. that you need to have an understanding of the applied application of these disciplines um, to 21st century careers and, and skill sets mm -hmm. um, that makes you a STEM educator. And so I think I'm most excited about this project, um, but that's probably an artifact because I have been on a on a push to, to create this um, proposal and get it off. And I had just done so about two hours ago. Oh, wow. Wow. So I'm excited about yeah. that. Um, the other thing that I think I'm excited about is expanding um, definitions and discussions regarding effective teachers to include um, intercultural competencies mm -hmm. and global awareness. Mm -hmm. um, I really think that that more than ever, good teachers um, are able to connect their discipline to relevant examples. And those examples are not just in their backyard, but across the globe. Right. So uh, to really help students understand how their global citizens are connected to a bigger, a bigger world um, and to help teachers and students develop the skills so that they can connect from vastly different people, you know? Um, and one of the efforts that I have to support that is um, for the last three years, I've been bringing a group of 22 um, high school and middle school teachers mm -hmm. from around the world to Claremont for a six weeks residency program. Wow. Uh, and when I say around the world last year, I think we had 17 countries represented. Wow. Uh, Nepal, um, Guatemala, uh, El Salvador, uh, Azerbaijan, mm -hmm. uh, Ukraine, which is in the news right now, uh, South Africa, Rwanda, mm -hmm. uh, India, uh, Bangladesh, um, Cambodia, you know, wow. and... Uh, I'm very excited about um, efforts to help teachers um, develop these competencies. Mm -hmm. And I do think that one of the ways to develop them is by going abroad. And so this program brings international teachers to the U.S. But I've also created a, a program that helps U.S. teachers go abroad. Mm -hmm. And... You know that in the state of California, credentialing is a two-step process. You have to first get your preliminary credential, mm -hmm. and then you have to earn your second credential, a clear credential, mm -hmm. through an induction program. We have an induction program that people can do while teaching abroad. Nice. And so somebody can go teach in India for a year mm -hmm. while they clear their California credential. Um, wow. And in the process, develop those competencies right. that I was talking about. So I'm excited about that. That, that is awesome. That is awesome. And, and how do you identify uh, the teachers that you bring over? You know, it's actually not through us. It's the U.S. Department of State does it. Okay. So they have a program that they run. It's called um, Teaching Excellence and Achievement, the T program, mm -hmm. that they partner with uh, an agency called IREX. And they work with the U.S. embassies um, in certain countries to identify uh, teachers. And they go through a very rigorous uh, application process mm -hmm. before wow. they get here. Well, uh, Dr. Ganley, it has been a sincere pleasure um, sitting down with you and picking your brain about, about teaching. It's always, um, li like I said earlier, it's, it's a little uh, interesting coming back to, to my, old, my old campus, but again, these were, this is where it all started for me. Yeah. And, and I'm so grateful that you took time out to, uh, to talk a little bit about education and, um, and how we're preparing new teachers. And uh, again, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Oh, it's been my pleasure. What a treat to be able to sit down and talk to you and just sort of step away from the office visit yeah. and talk about things that matter. Awesome. So to the listeners, I know you've received a lot of great information here on this episode. Now it's up to you to take it back to your classroom and implement what you learned today. So until next time, be amazing. The Amazing Teacher Podcast is brought to you by successintheclassroom.com. Learn more about being an amazing teacher by visiting successintheclassroom.com or theamazingteacher.com.